This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Welcome to the Rational Reminder with Cameron and Ben. I want to talk a little bit today about value stocks. So we put an emphasis on value stocks in our clients' portfolios and our own our own portfolios too. Uh, we're not value investors like Warren Buffett is. We're not analyzing companies and finding cheap companies relative to their future earnings or whatever. Those guys do. Uh, we don't really believe that can add value. But what we do do is total market investing using index funds or funds from dimensional fund advisors. Uh, but we use funds from dimensional fund advisors that have more weight and value stocks uh, than the than the market does. So, so we should uh, probably define a value stock, I guess, by their definition? Uh, yeah. So a value stock is a stock that has a low price relative to its book value. Uh, the market will price stocks uh, based on their expected future earnings. So if a company has relatively low expected future earnings, then the price will not be that much greater than the company's book value or its assets. This is basically a story about the price of the stock. So the stock's price goes down, it becomes a better value to acquire in simple terms. So it's really a story about the price. Yeah. The cheaper you buy something, all things being equal, it'll have a higher expected return. Yeah. And you can look at price relative to book value, price relative to earnings. Those are both ways to define a value stock, uh, the, the academic literature tends to favor price to book. Correct. Uh, anyway, so in the U.S., the value premium since 1928 through 2017 has been about 3.5%. So value stocks minus growth stocks, so the return of value stocks minus the return of growth stocks has been positive 3.5%. So in simple terms, shares whose price has gone down typically outperform a pool of shares whose price has gone up by about 3.5% a year. Right. So the cheaper stocks outperform the more expensive stocks in the U.S., as far as we have data going back to 1928, uh, outperform by 3.5%. And there's lots of reason for that. I mean, some people say it's a behavioral reason. People overreact and sell off stocks. Other people say it's a risk story. Like, you know, Fama and French, the professors that are behind this research, suggest that it's a risk story. Yeah, I like the risk story a lot. Uh, Larry Swedro, in one of his books, talked a lot about the risk story for value stocks and just things like higher operating leverage, uh, so higher fixed expenses, makes it harder for value companies to change their business model uh, as the market's changing, whereas growth stocks like uh, Apple and, and Facebook, they're, they're tech companies, they're much more nimble, they can pivot, all that kind of stuff. So. Just based on that, there's there's additional risk baked into value stocks. Anyway, over the last 10 years, that risk has not paid off in the U.S. Uh, seven of the last 10 years have been negative for the value premium. So growth stocks have been outperforming value stocks in the U.S. Uh, a lot of that story uh, is kind of captured with the FANG stocks, crazy growth stocks with massively growing earnings, but also massively growing prices relative to their earnings. So not only are the earnings going up, the prices relative to the earnings, that multiple, is also going up. Uh, another interesting point is that in the, this is a, so that we are in this 10-year period where uh, value stocks have underperformed. By 3% or so, I think, per year. Yeah, over the period. Uh, but the really interesting thing is that we are in one of 13 10-year periods. So there have only been 13 10-year periods since 1928 uh, until now where value has underperformed for 10 years and we're in one of those periods. Um, so it's And I know a client asked, asked us this a couple of weeks ago, like is this not a different era where it is kind of a winner-take-all in technology? So that was his thesis that you should be concentrating on these securities because they, they could take it all. Have you had that question? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it too. That, yeah, sure, that can happen. But that kind of ignores the whole idea of capitalism and competition uh, and risk. Also, it, it ignores risk. Uh, if, if it were really a, a, a risk-free profit by capturing those largest companies, um, well, the price would be bid up even more than it's been bid up, and you wouldn't expect a positive return afterwards. 
but they have to keep making a lot of money for a long time to justify these multiples. And we've seen today, yesterday, and today, uh, Facebook released some earnings that were maybe not as exciting as they have been. And Zuckerberg also gave some guidance that he expects profit margins to be lower going forward because they've got to spend more on security and some of their advertising revenue sources uh, are, are decreasing. And I mean, that was a it was a big drop in one day for uh, for any stock, but Facebook dropped twenty percent, and it's down again today. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how that affects this whole growth uh, growth story. Um, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, which they've been around for for a long time, and their in their Q two investor letter, they had some really interesting comments. They're they're they are kind of the type of value investor I guess that I was alluding to earlier. Well, they're a little bit more quantitative actually. But they're they're a value an active management value investing firm, um, and so since they, they've they, in their research that they wrote about in the the, the Q two investor letter, um, they talked about how since two thousand ten growth has outperformed value in every sector in the U S. So it's not just tech; every single sector growth has outperformed value. The uh, Russell one thousand value index and the Russell 1000 growth index are what they use for comparisons. And they showed that the earnings per share growth for value companies has been much lower than it has been for the growth companies. But I, I mentioned this at the beginning, too. Uh, the, the growth companies have also seen their prices relative to their earnings increase. So earnings are going up. Prices relative to earnings are also going up. So that's why I've seen this, this big jump uh, in, in the share prices for those types of companies. But kind of like what we were just talking about with Facebook. Uh, when you start seeing big PE growth, uh, and then expectations change, because that PE is just it's the market's expectations. When those expectations change, uh, it can get pretty ugly pretty quickly. And a lot of people have been right for a long time on this, and I think there might be overconfidence bias baked into behavioral right now too. So I'd be concerned about that as well. Right, and that's what we see with those high high prices relative to uh, relative to earnings. Um, the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that a lot of this dialogue tends to focus on the U.S. and U.S. companies and the FANG stocks and the S&P 500, and, and that does not tell anywhere near the whole story for people who are actually investing their savings. Um, if we look at Canada, so we're talking about the U.S. value is underperformed for 10 years. Um, that doesn't mean value is underperformed everywhere. If we look at Canada, uh, value has I mean, more than under, uh, outperformed growth over the last 10 years. Uh, it's outperformed, if we look at the MSCI BARA Canadian Value Index compared to the BARA Growth Index, values outperformed in Canada by 55 a little bit more than 5.5% per year for the last 10 years. Yep. That's, that's pretty crazy. Uh, and no one's really talking about that story. Massive premium. Yeah, and that and that's just tell the sto- tells the story of why we diversify um, but not just geographically, we, we diversify across factors. Um, and I think we, people that listen to this podcast will start to hear more and more about factors from, from us. We, we talk about it a lot. But, um, and the magic really is in rebalancing with those factors too. So we have fixed weightings in each of these factors. So as the valuations move around, things are rebalanced. You're effectively selling high and buying low all the time. Yeah which gives a higher expected return overall over time. And studies have shown that it gives lower volatility in prices. That's right. So we look at stuff like the value as a factor. Uh, we're talking about how values out, outperformed in Canada, underperformed in the U.S. for the last 10 years. Small cap is also, or size is also a factor. So if you look at small companies uh, in the U.S. and in the EFI index, small has beaten large over the last 10 years. So if you're only investing in U.S. value, you've underperformed. But if you're investing in U.S. value, Canadian value, uh, U.S. small, international small, you're doing, you're doing okay. I mean, better than, better than okay. So stuff like this, when, when you hear about something scary, like, oh, value's underperforming, yeah, in one geographic region. Right. Uh, which is always important to, for, uh, I think, important for investors to keep context with stuff like that. And don't fall in love with a factor. Or yeah. don't fall in love with a region. Or choose a factor. Have have a set allocation and continue to rebalance. That's right. 
it's important to have a philosophy and then as david booth says founder of dimensional have a philosophy and stick with it yeah it's the most important thing for any investor We've talked about that too with dividend investors. It's like we, there, there's no research to show that dividend paying stocks will do better than the market. There's nothing to, to support that. But dividend investors tend to be uh, happy, confident, whatever you want to call it. Fervent in their beliefs. And that's fine. If that's what it takes to make you uh, stick with the portfolio, then sure, buy dividend stocks. It's not the most diversified strategy, but whatever. If it keeps you invested, that's uh, better, than, better than nothing. Uh, there was a good article in the Wall Street Journal. Well, good. I don't know. It's interesting. Um, but it talked about how for the first six months of 2018, and again, this is U.S. specific, the amount of money going into passive mutual funds and exchange traded funds that has been going in at a rate 44% lower than over the same period in the previous year. I find that data so surprising, especially in the U.S. where so much money is going towards Vanguard. And their their ETF and fund complex, I I, I believe it, but I'm skeptical. Well, Barry Ritholtz wrote a, a good opinion piece in Bloomberg about this exact data point, uh, and he's basically saying that index funds in the United States, where they've they have seen crazy growth, have been going through an unsustainable period of growth, where they've been adding so much assets to passive uh, and away from active that it, it, you can't keep going. It, it just wouldn't keep going at that rate. Uh, so he's his hypothesis is that we've kind of reached not not peak indexing necessarily, but we've reached a point where uh, the the massive flows into passive might slow down to a more a more sustainable pace uh, going forward. Um, and Barry wrote that he doesn't think that this slowdown means the trend is going to reverse. It's kind of more just going to level uh, level out. Uh, and Barry had a pretty funny comment in that article too. He said that. Uh, that he that active funds wish they had the problem of slowing inflows because <laughs> yeah. they've had massive outflows. Massive, massive outflows. Yeah, I mean the same thing's going on in Canada, but at a much different rate, I suspect. Yeah, well, the the data point that we pulled uh, we pulled last last week or yeah yeah that was last week. Uh, I tweeted about it, um, but we looked at we looked at fund flows into RBC's mutual funds, which are I mean. Largely for, active. We could say I, it, pretty close to 100% active. Like it would be in the high 90, probably 99 plus percent uh, of their mutual funds are active. And so far in 2018, we've seen more inflows into RBC's mutual funds than we've seen into passive ETFs from Vanguard, BMO, iShares, and Horizons combined. So, or, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Totally different landscape in Canada. And much higher margin. The fees charged on those funds are much higher than all those other ones mentioned combined for sure. So oh, fees in Canada in general are way, way higher than the I think the average mutual fund fee in the States is uh, what, 70 basis points or 90 basis points or something. And in Canada, it's still 2.02% for uh, allocation funds. Different landscape. Yeah, different landscape. Different landscape. And the banks probably have a lot to do with that, um, I would guess. So there was a neat piece in The Economist last week wondering if markets had lost uh, any efficiency with the growth of index funds. And I think their hypothesis basically was that they have not gotten less efficient, and the main reason being that more and more of the bad managers are getting out of the business, therefore you're having more and more smart managers competing and setting prices in the marketplace. you agree with that, uh, yeah, thesis? Well, exactly. That's that's exactly. We, we haven't seen any data to support active management as, as winning. Like it's not starting to outperform constantly. We're definitely not seeing that. Um, so that that doesn't support the idea that markets are getting less efficient. Um, and you don't need a lot of people to have market efficiency. Yeah, and you have know, price you don't. efficiency and price discovery and the research being done. And there's still so many people doing so much research with so much technology that uh, hard to see it becoming inefficient anytime soon. Right. What you said is exactly right, that uh, as indexing grows and people, investors realize that, hey, indexing is an option and, hey, maybe active management isn't what I need, the bad active managers are going to get weeded out. And don't you find when a new person comes through the door and you explain our investment philosophy, they get it. It makes sense. When you have so many smart people with CFA designations, and great technology competing on prices, does it not make sense when there's, what, 70 million to 100 million 
shared trades per day, that there's a whole lot of discovery going on in those prices, people get it. It's very intuitive. Well, the people who come to talk to us get it. But we know from the data that the majority of people in Canada, anyway, don't get it still. But I think that's probably because they don't know about it. Yeah. I think so many people have no idea what indexing is about. Yeah, could and be. And don't know the data that, that is behind it. And, but it takes uh, it takes a lot, and actually we'll, we'll talk about this. I know you want to talk about uh, Richard Thaler. Um, but it takes work to get it. It takes work to understand the data, and most people won't do that. And if you go and look online, there's enough stuff from active managers that say that indexing is risky or indexing is bad for some reason. There's enough stuff like that that if you want to convince yourself that active management is good, you can do it. You well, we decided that. a long time ago not to try to convince people of this. Right. They, they'll have to get there on their own. Absolutely. But if people are ambivalent when they come in, most people get it and embrace it. Yeah, that's true. Um, when we're talking about active managers and, and only the most skilled active managers being left, uh, I saw an example I think I saw an example about tennis players, but you could use use someone like LeBron James to make the same case. If you took a copy of LeBron James and had him play one on one on a basketball court against himself, the games aren't going to be won based on skill or talent or whatever because it's the same set of skills. It's the same person right. in, in in this hypothetical example. Uh, those games, those one on one games, are going to be won based on luck. You know, if he if he makes. 80% of his shots, and it happens in that game that one of the LeBrons misses more shots than he would on average, he's going to lose. But that's luck. That's not, uh, that's not skill. And it's the same thing that's happening when we have fewer and fewer active managers who are the most skilled and have the best information. When it's them competing against each other, it's not any easier to, to win. It's harder. It's harder to win because there aren't any bad active managers left for them to uh, for them to exploit. Plus, those bad active managers, I mean, to think about it, they have to get the price wrong now to let you buy it cheaper, then they have to be willing to buy it back from you later higher. So they have to get it, like, they have to become smarter over time? Is that how it works? <laughs> so they're dumb now, they sell it to you cheap, but then all of a sudden they're smart to buy it back from you high. So it means they have to be dumb on both sides, dumb low, dumb high. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make when sense. When you think about the actual transactions that are going on behind the scenes. And if we do end up with a, a relatively small handful of really good active managers, now again, if they're competing against each other, it's going to be hard to actually, wh whether they're skilled or not, it's going to be hard to actually win consistently. But let's say we do have a manager who can win consistently. They really do have an edge over the other, other managers. Just the economics of that, they will, well, a couple of things might happen. They, they could increase their fees in terms of how much they're charging their clients because they're, they're producing better returns. Therefore, they can charge more. But the other thing that can happen is that their assets will grow. And Larry Swedro has written, uh, he has the line that uh, successful active managers sow the seeds of their own destruction or something along those lines. Because as soon as you have great performance, your fund's going to grow. And then you can't keep having great performance. I mean, it's the same kind of thing we've seen with uh, Warren Buffett. He says it himself. It's so big now that it's hard to, you are the market. How do you, how do you beat it? Um, yeah. Fama talked about this in the past too. Uh, he, he's been asked, at what point, is there a tipping point, or when, when does indexing get too big? And he says it has the exact same answer that we're, we're talking about. Um, Fama says that even if indexing is a majority, as long as the remaining active managers are skilled and have good information, markets will still be efficient, and potentially even more efficient because the bad active managers are, right. are gone. Um, next topic. So I listened to my favorite podcast or one of my favorite podcasts, Freakonomics. And a couple of weeks ago, they had on Dr. Richard Thaler, who is a um, behavioral ec economist from Chicago, University of Chicago. So he just won the Nobel Prize last, uh, last fall in economics. And so his research has been around, you know, the biases that we all have and how we make economic decisions. So probably most famous for his whole idea around nudge where you can have policy changes that will cause people to behave in a different way. So right now there's over 200 nudges around the world that have been implemented in public policy. And one of the ones when he was asked, you know, what's the biggest one that you can think of that's had the greatest impact? 
and he talked about the 401k plan in the U.S., where many 401k, which is like a group RSP at work, instead of having you make the decision if you want to opt in or not, the default is for you to opt in. So when people were not automatically opted into the plan, the enrollment was very low. When they reversed that and had automatic opt-in, enrollment went up dramatically. Same as when you get up front, decide if your salary goes up, do you want your contributions to increase? When you had that as a tick box, people's contribution rates went up dramatically. So it's had a huge impact. This is an example of what he has done. So he talks about different biases that we all have and errors that we persistently make. So the host, Stephen Dubner, asked him, you know, we all know we've heard about these biases and errors that we all make over time. He says, why do we as human beings keep on making these mistakes? And I thought he'd give a great answer, which applies to our world in working with clients. He said, the answer is not that people are dumb. The answer is that the world is hard. And we have many competing forces as we try to make decisions. So the example he gave there was exactly our world. You know, so many people will say, well, you know, I can do this on my own. I can manage my own portfolio. But we all have these biases built in. And the reality is retirement planning is hard. Thinking about how much money you might want per month, at what point in life, how much money do I have to save? The math behind that is not easy, especially if you want to have a robust plan. There's statistical work that has to get done. You take all of that math and planning, which many people don't like to do, along with these biases we all have and how we react to how the market behaves, competing as well with the constant bombardment we have about buying stuff. You know, marketing is after us all the time to be upgrading our house or our car or whatever. So delaying gratification is hard. You have to delay gratification in order to save. So putting those three factors all together is really, really hard. So I thought that was a great proposition for why people choose to work with firms like us. We see that in, in Canada too, not not necessarily nudges, but maybe the, the lack of, of nudges. Uh, you see it with stuff like people not saving enough for retirement because in Canada we don't usually have automatic opt-in. If you don't have a pension, whether it's defined contribution or defined benefit, most people don't have a pension and therefore it's up to you to make your RSP contributions. And you're right, what you're saying is that people don't know how much to contribute, they don't know when to start contributing, uh, and it, it's hard to figure those things out. So a lot of people won't do it. Um, but it's easy to see that house you want to buy. It's easy to imagine that beautiful kitchen you're going to have. Yeah, definitely. And it also, the home ownership uh, thing that you just said, I think that also speaks to Canadians uh, wanting to buy real estate because it, it it probably does end up being one of their best assets if they're not disciplined and don't understand the issues. Right. Because uh, if you're not saving, but you buy a house, well, hey, the house is forcing you to save. So that's that's not a bad thing. Um, yeah. So I think that the the idea of the nudges is, is really, really smart. And so we end up becoming the nudge effectively. Like we're working right now for someone who's asking us, can I afford this cottage? What is the impact on my retirement in 30 years, if you can believe it, if I buy a cottage today? So we're running the math this afternoon just on that exact scenario. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, Canadian Medical Association selling MD management? Yeah. So sold this to Scotia Bank and um, for $2.6 billion. Yeah, so I think it caught a lot of physicians off guard. Not so much that they didn't know that MD management was a profit center, but I think they're questioning now, and this is what the point of the article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal was, that many doctors are wondering if they're going to continue to work in doctors' best interest. They knew if it was MD management, of course they were working in our they best thought, interest. They thought that. They, they felt that way. So they're just openly wondering, will that change a lot? And I know in a few doctors that we work with, they're saying they've heard that concern as well through their peers. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I know the perception, like you're saying, uh, from physicians has been that, well, MD is looking out for doctors and it's for doctors, by doctors and all that kind of stuff. Uh, MD, the fact is, it was always a profit center, uh, like you said. Right. And the Scotia Bank is definitely going to rationalize things over time and cross-sell, which may be great for the doctors. You get perhaps deals on mortgages or credit cards yeah, or something, but there know. will be certainly a sales process that comes through this organization to get the revenue up, without a doubt. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the fallout of that. Um, very interesting. All I know, the doctors we work with appreciate having consistent service from the people they know. So it's, it's very different than the bank model. Yeah, definitely different. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the yield curve in the U.S., which has been flattening out. 
Uh, what does we, that mean? That means that short-term interest rates, which are mostly set by the government, uh, have been increasing, whereas long-term rates, which are mostly set by market forces, have been remaining relatively the same. So as the short-term rate approaches the long-term rate, that's called a flattening of the yield curve. If the short-term rate exceeds the long-term rate, that is called an inversion of the yield curve. If the yield curve inverts, uh, it, it tends to be a signal of an impending recession, which tends to lead to low stock returns. Uh, so a lot of talk about that. People are nervous. The last times, I think the last seven times the yield curve is inverted, it has led to a market correction or an economic recession, which maybe led to a market correction. Keeping that in mind, this does not mean that it's obvious to that, that we need to change anything in portfolios. You don't need to go to cash. Uh, even if the yield curve does invert in the past, when that's happened, there's been a lag. And the lag between <clears throat> yield curve inversion and a recession varies in time. So if you try and get out of the market before the downturn, uh, you, you may very well miss the growth between when the yield curve inverts and when the uh, when the recession actually begins, so it's not a it's not a foolproof market timing tool. Um, now, all of that's interesting. There was a, a paper last year in, in December that was talking about the the different factors. So again, we're talking about factors, but it was talking about the different factors uh, in various market cycles. And I, I won't go into too much detail of the paper, but uh, the the general idea is that factors perform differently at different stages of the market cycle. So if you're only invested in the market, you're only invested in a market cap weighted index of stocks. Like the S&P 500. Sure, like the S&P 500. That tends to have negative performance in a recession. But you start right. adding in other factors. So value, uh, profitability, investment, those are all factors that can be invested in and that are captured in, in portfolios from uh, the, with the products that we use from Dimensional. And that's really the key takeaway for our clients is to know that you have deliberate allocation to these different factors with regular rebalancing. Right. So as long as you're factor diversified, I mean, that's, it's just more of an argument not to worry about the, the yield curve. Uh, ben Carlson also shared a paper that uh, I think one of his readers sent to him talking about the predictive power of the, of the yield curve around the world. And the, the conclusion of the paper was that the, uh, the yield curve, the yield curve's predictive ability or predictive uh, capacity in in the U.S. is an outlier compared to other countries. So while the yield curve has been pretty good at predicting recessions in the U.S., that has not held true wow. in other countries. Um, the paper also found that the predictive power of the yield curve seems to be declining. They also found that when Japan had their zero interest rate policy, the predictive power of the yield curve again uh, went away. And now we're in a somewhat similar situation in the U.S. with uh, very, very low interest rates. So based on that, relationship with uh, what happened in Japan, maybe this time, <laughs> classic last words, I guess, maybe this time it's different. Uh, but in a, even if it's not, it doesn't mean that the yield curve is a reason to go to cash. Right. E and the yield curve is not inverted yet. If it does invert, it does not mean that it's uh, a reason to go to cash. And it's the same advice we give for anything. Stay invested. Don't, wor don't worry about it. Plus, uh, everybody knows this information, so you can make the argument that it will be priced in. Yeah, you most likely have more to lose by trying to right. time the market than by than by just staying invested. Um, chat briefly about that. Uh, I mean, uh, everybody was talking about it on on Twitter, but we can chat a bit about that. The Twitter's Twitter people that we follow, anyways. Sure. Yeah, our Twitter world. Yeah, just talking about the the top weightedness of the S and P five hundred. So, uh, Michael Batnick, who is a, a podcaster we follow, Animal Spirits. And he put out a chart that caused a bit of controversy uh, to those who really cared about those kinds of details, just showing how much of the S&P 500, which are 500 large US, larger U.S. stocks, was weighted in the top five stocks. So you have Apple, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, which is Google, Microsoft, and Facebook represented the same total value as the bottom 292 companies in the S&P 500. I think it was 282. I had a type one up there. Yep. Okay, so just under 300 companies, so huge weighting. It looked in this chart like those five companies were 50% of the index, which is not true. I think they're closer to 16% of the total index. But still, you have five companies out of 500 representing such a, uh, a high-end weight. 
And the S&P 500 is a great way to invest. Very cheap. You can buy an S&P 500 ETF for just a few basis points, and it has had great performance. But we like to be more diversified. So you take a look at the DFA US portfolio that we use for clients. You know, the top five companies in that portfolio make up 9% of the fund. So it's a very different weighting factor that goes on. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the 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 story with that with that Batnick tweet, um, it, it really ended up being that the chart that he shared was just kind of kind of wacky, and uh, I know they were defending themselves, uh, saying yeah. that they they did disclose what the chart was supposed to represent, but they did, but you had to read it carefully. It it, it wasn't a great chart, and I think it made people scared. Like, wow, that's that's pretty crazy. That the S and P five hundred. It looked like the S and P five hundred was. Uh, half of it was made up of these five stocks, which is not even close right. uh, to the case. And actually, the concentration in the top five stocks over time in the S&P 500 has been pretty flat. So we're not even in a different territory right now. Uh, anyway, that was just kind of a, kind of interesting because the inter- internet got so up in arms about the tweet, and it didn't actually end up really really mattering too much. But it was interesting to dig into the market cap weighting of the S&P versus the DFA uh, U.S. equity, just because D- we know, as we know, DFA is very deliberate about not having those market cap weights. They're going to decrease the weights to the largest companies, and we see that in, right. in the uh, in that comparison. So, 16% to the top five companies in the S&P 500 versus 9% in the DFA U.S. Core Equity Fund. Uh, so that was that was kind of fun to dig to dig into. Um, before we wrap up, uh, Rob Rob Carrick did have a piece on on how wealth management firms are, are really failing millennials. There, uh, only two percent of, of wealth management clients tend to be of the millennial generation, and the average age of wealth management firms is sixty four uh, of wealth management firm clients is uh, sixty four years. And we thought that was really interesting. Jumped it at us because our average client age uh, here is is forty seven years. So pretty substantial difference. Yeah, and the average advisor, I think, in Canada is in the mid-50s, I believe. So this may be changing. Uh, perhaps a lot of the millennials are going towards a robo-advisors. The I challenge. think at the end of the day, I, I did an interview earlier today about this, about robo-advisors. Oh, did you? Uh, with, uh, yeah, that article should come out later this week, I guess. But uh, do robo-advisors replace us? I, don't, I think the answer is no, they don't. It's a completely different service offering. Um, and what it comes down to, I think, is the relationship and behavioral coaching and just having someone that you know and trust. Uh, well, it goes back to the nudge. Who's going to take care of all that stuff? Sure. There's no way you can automate all that. You can't automate the, the, well, you, the... I don't I don't think... Maybe you can. I don't know. But it takes a lot of input from the individual. We see enough people coming from, you know, they maybe tried well simple and they decide, hey, this this isn't what I want. I actually want advice. So we've seen enough people yep. transfer over uh, just based on that. That, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical that robot. My point is, will. you can automate this side of the business, but you can't automate someone reaching out to us. You can't automate someone making the contributions and sitting down and actually planning out their future. And thinking about it. You can't automate the thinking. And a lot of people don't want to do that. And uh, the, the reporter that was, did that interview, la- the last statistic I had was that Wellsimple had 65,000 customers with nine, uh, 10 people licensed to give advice. And the, the reporter that I spoke with this morning, she'd actually talked to Wellsimple earlier in the day. And they actually have uh, 80,000 clients now with nine people licensed to give oh. investment advice. Yeah, I know. Wow. We have, know. what, 13, 12, 13 licensed with 600-odd families? So yeah, whole different ratio. Whole different ratio. Um, yeah. And the, the advice piece, I think, or the, the advice and the relationship, I think, is, uh, yeah, I, I, that's going to be tough to make that go away or to, to lose its value. Uh, all right. That's Anything a wrap. Else? Anything else? Nope. That's good. All right. Talk that's to you it. next week.